The Theology of Christian Perfection, Part 35 The Soul Directed Since spiritual direction involves two persons, the success of the direction is not guaranteed by the mere fact that the director possesses all the necessary qualities and understands the purpose and function of spiritual direction. There are also definite requisites demanded of the soul that submits to the spiritual director, and these requisites flow, first of all, from the nature of the spiritual direction itself, and second, from the relationship of the person directed with the spiritual director. As regards the direction itself, it cannot be successful unless the person is directed possesses the following qualities. 1. Sincerity. This is the first and most important quality, because without it, any kind of direction is impossible. The spiritual director has to know all temptations and weaknesses, desires and resolutions, good and evil inclinations, difficulties and trials, success and failure, etc. If he is to guide the soul to greater perfection, his hands are tied unless he has sufficient knowledge of the soul. Although the spiritual director need not also be a confessor, it would be impossible to give any spiritual direction if the director were to know nothing of the sins and the imperfections of the individual. One should reveal to the director whatever has any importance in regard to the spiritual life, but it is not necessary, and it would even be an abuse, to give him a detailed account of petty trifles and insignificant events. But what is revealed should be revealed with all the frankness and sincerity, without condoning or excusing one's failures or exaggerating one's virtues. 2. Obedience. The director does not possess any authority by which he can demand strict obedience. Spiritual direction is a matter of perfect liberty on the part of the director and the person directed. By the very fact that a person seeks the help of the director, however, the two are not on equal footing. But the director is in a position of superiority as master and guide. Granted the voluntary submission of a person to the director, the director has a right to expect docility and obedience from the one who is directed. If these are lacking, there can be no spiritual direction. For that reason, the director should demand obedience of the soul in all of those things which pertain to spiritual direction, and if this is not granted, he should discontinue the direction. The soul should obey simply, without discussions or personal interpretations, and it should be noted that even worse than obedience is the duplicity by which a soul would so ingratiate itself with the director that he would command it to do only the things which the soul wants to do. St. John of the Cross, however, severely condemns this abuse. This does not mean, however, that an individual may not take the initiative in order to make the manifestation of conscience, or to point out particular difficulties or obstacles that the director perhaps did not see. What is to be thought of the vow of obedience, which some persons have taken to their spiritual director? In general, it is not advisable because of the disadvantages connected to it, such as too much responsibility for the director, anxiety for the person directed, too much passivity, unnecessary visits and interviews, etc. In any case, the director should never take the initiative and suggest that a person make a vow of obedience to him, for this would be an abuse of his authority and his office. It would be an even greater abuse if a director were to add to the vow of obedience the promise never to change directors or never to consult anyone else. But if an individual voluntarily and repeatedly requests permission to make a vow of obedience to the director for an increase of merit, it could be permitted under the following circumstances. A. That the vow be made for a short period of time and then renewed if desired. B that it be restricted to certain manners which are clearly stated, such as the time of prayer, the types of mortification, the work in the apostolate, etc. c. That the person making the vow be perfectly normal, serene, and balanced. d. That the vow may be revoked if any difficulties or anxieties arise. What is to be done if a conflict arises between the commands of the lawful superior and those of a spiritual director? One must unhesitatingly obey the superior, even if he has taken a vow of obedience to his director. It should be noted that private vows taken by religious are null and void without the approval of their superiors, and even if one has received permission of a religious superior to make a vow of obedience to one's director, the superior never loses the power over the subject which is the result of religious profession. 3. Perseverance. The very nature of spiritual direction requires that the person directed should persevere in seeking the help and guidance of the director. Any spiritual direction or counseling is rendered sterile by the frequent changes of directors, by absenting oneself for long periods, and by the constant change of spiritual exercises and means of sanctification, or by letting oneself be led by a caprice of the moment, instead of following the instructions received from the director. When serious reasons justify a change, a person should not hesitate to find a new director. But that is something quite distinct from the fickleness and inconstancy, which is manifested by some persons in changing from one director to another under the slightest pretext. 4. Discretion. The person receiving spiritual direction should never forget that, if the director is obliged to the seal of confession or to natural secrecy, the one receiving direction is obliged to observe silence concerning the director. As a general rule, a person should never reveal to others the particular admonitions or counsels which have been received from the spiritual director. Such advice is given to a particular person in view of the particular circumstances, and does not to other persons living in different circumstances. Many directors have suffered greatly as a result of the indiscretion of their penitents, and this is sufficient reason for a director to refuse to continue the direction of such a person. The principal qualities required of the person directed in relation to the director are respect, confidence, and supernatural love. 1. Respect. The person directed must see in the director not merely a man who is gifted with certain qualities, but the lawful representative of food, but the lawful representative of God in Christ. 
No matter what defects or perfections he may have in the natural order, he must be regarded with respect precisely as a director and guide of the spiritual life. This profound respect will be most useful, not only in fostering the docility and obedience of the person directed, but also in serving as a break to any excessive confidence or sensual affection towards the director. 2. Confidence. In addition to respect, there should be absolute confidence in the director. It should be a confidence which is truly filial, and so absolute that one can always be perfectly natural and frank when dealing with the director. If the person directed is timid and self-conscious, the spiritual direction will never be completely efficacious. 3. Supernatural love. Once a person has cultivated a filial confidence towards the director, it usually happens that a true love develops for the director. This is one of the most delicate problems in the relationship between the spirit theoretical question, but one that occurs with the utmost frequency. There is nothing unlawful about a love for one spiritual director as long as the love remains entirely on a supernatural level. The lives of the saints give countless cases in which there has been this type of holy love. The difficulty lies in keeping the love on a purely supernatural level. The cause of love may be any one of the many causes of love in general. It is not at all likely that, in many instances, the love of a woman for her spiritual director is purely natural, proceeding from the normal affinity that exists between a man and a woman. The love could also be the result of the spiritual relation, however, and in this case it is nothing more than a reaction to the paternal interest and affection which has been manifested by the director, and a sense of gratitude for all that he has done for the individual. The danger that lies in the love or friendship between a director and a woman is augmented by the fact that the director necessarily must know about matters of conscience, temptations, and even sins. Moreover, if the love for the director is purely natural, there is, no, there is always the possibility of venial sins such as envy, jealousy, suspicion, scandal to others, not to mention the ever-present danger of sensual love. Even if a director is convinced that there is no danger to himself or his penitent, he must always be conscious of the danger of scandal to others. St. Teresa of Avila experienced an attachment to a spiritual director and has written some practical observations on the subject. As a consequence of all this, the person directed, and this applies especially to women, should make every effort to see the director as another Christ, to confer with him only when necessary, and scrupulously to avoid any, mani any manifestation of human affection. As regards the director, he must have a most delicate conscience and refined prudence in these matters, without going to the extreme of being excessively timid, suspicious, or gruff. If it is a question of mutual sensible attent affection, which is recognized by both parties, it would become prudent for the individual directed to seek another spiritual director. The reason for this is not only the obvious danger that such a friendship may easily degenerate into sensual affection, but also that under these conditions it would be difficult to have true and efficacious spiritual direction. If the director experiences a sensible affection for the person directed, he should examine it before God in order to discover whether such an affection disturbs his spirit, places him in danger of temptation, impedes the liberty which he should have as a spiritual director, or is the source of some other danger. In this case, without revealing his feelings to the person directed, he should find some reasonable cause for abandoning the direction. If, in spite of the sensible affection, he does not experience any danger of temptation or any obstacle to the direction, he may proceed with the direction, but always keeping a prudent vigilance over himself. If, finally, the director realizes that his penitent has developed a sensible affection for him, and he himself does not return that affection, he should examine whether or not such an affection is disturbing the peace of soul of, or provoking temptation for, the, per the person directed. If so, he should advise and even command that the individual seek another spiritual director. If there is no danger that the affection of the penitent may degenerate into sensual love, he may continue the direction of that individual. But he will be very careful, lest some imprudent word or act he should augment that human affection. Special Questions We shall terminate the present chapter with a discussion of certain particular questions which may arise in the matter of spiritual direction. The first question concerns the choice of a spiritual director. Some persons are not in a position to choose their own director, for example, cloistered nuns or persons who do not have access to several priests. In such cases, one must do as well as possible with the director at hand, and trust in God to supply for any deficiencies in the director. Apart from these particular cases, the choice of a spiritual director should be made in the following way. The first thing to be done is to ask God in prayer for the light of grace to proceed prudently in the important matter. Then one should investigate who among the available priests possesses the prudence and charity which are necessary for a good director. Under no circumstances should the choice be made because of one's natural inclinations towards a particular priest, although it should be recognized that it would be more difficult to open one's heart with confidence to a priest for whom one feels repugnance or antipathy. It is not advisable to ask the priest immediately to be the spiritual director, but the one should test him for a time to see whether he or not will be able to fulfill the task of director. 
All things being equal, one should seek the holiest priest for ordinary cases, and the most learned priest for extraordinary cases. Once the choice has been made, a person should not easily change directions. But it may sometimes prove necessary for a person to seek a different spiritual director, although one should not readily or too easily believe that it is necessary to change directors. Some of the insufficient reasons for changing one's director are inconstancy of character, which makes it impossible for the individual to persevere for a long time in the same spiritual exercises, pride, which causes the individual to seek out the priest who is most popular, excessive anxiety, which causes a person to go from one director to another, because none of them ever seem to be able to help the soul, a false sense of shame, which leads the individual to avoid the regular confessor when it is a matter of confessing certain humiliating faults, and injured feelings as the result of a disagreement with the director, or a severe correction received from the director. The reasons that are sufficiently serious for changing one's spiritual director can be listed under two heads, if the direction has become useless or harmful. The spiritual direction becomes useless when, in spite of one's good and sincere desire to advance in holiness, one does not feel towards the director the respect, confidence, and frankness which are indispensable for the efficacy of the spiritual direction. It would also be a futile effort if one perceives that the director never dares to make corrections of one's own defects. It does not encourage progress in virtue, does not solve problems, and shows no special interest in the sanctification of the individual. The direction would be harmful if the person directed discovers that the director lacks the necessary knowledge, prudence, and discretion, when one feeds the vanity and commonplace of the individual, readily tolerates one's faults and perfections, or judges things from a point of view that is too natural, when the director wastes time by frivolous conversations, or by asking questions out of simple curiosity, or in discussing matters which are not related to growth in holiness, or when one perceives that there has developed a strong sensible affection on the part of one or both, when the director imposes obligations that are beyond one's strength or incompatible with the duties of one's state in life, or wishes that the individual promise never to seek counsel from any other priest, when one perceives clearly that the advice given has been harmful instead of helpful. It should be noted, however, that one may easily be mistaken in making judgments concerning the competence of the director and the efficacy of the direction, and for that reason it is imperative that one deliberate before making a change in spiritual directors. Would it be fitting to have several directors at the same time, although there have been cases in which a person had several spiritual directors, for example, St. Teresa of Avila? In general, it is not prudent or effective to do so. There is always the danger of a difference of opinion and a conflict, as the result of a discrepancy in the advice that was given. Nevertheless, it is perfectly compatible with the unity of direction to seek advice from other competent persons, when an especially difficult or extraordinary problem arises. As we have already stated, the director himself, if he is prudent and humble, will take the initiative and advise the penitent to consult another person. But apart from these cases, the unity of spiritual direction must always be preserved, especially when dealing with scrupulous persons, and this unity is best preserved by having one director. The last question to be answered in the matter of spiritual direction concerns direction given by mail. If it is a question of an isolated case in which an individual requests advice or the solution of a problem by mail, there is no reason why such direction should not be given in a letter if one observes the necessary precautions which are required whenever confidential matters are discussed by letter. If advice is requested by the persons who already have their own spiritual director, cause Great caution should be observed, especially if one is not sure of the good faith and discretion of the person who is asking advice. Sometimes individuals seek an answer in writing from another priest in order to show this letter to their own director and confront him with the advice that is contrary to that which he has given. If it is necessary for one priest to correct the advice given by another priest, this should always be done with utmost charity, and whenever possible it should be given as a amplification and further application of the advice already given, rather than a complete and total rectification. But what is to be said of the spiritual direction which is given entirely by mail? It may happen in exceptional cases that it is the only way in which a person can receive spiritual direction, and even apart from these cases there are examples of direction by mail in the lives of the saints. For example, St. Francis de Sales and St. Paul of the Cross. But the, 
but the disadvantages far outnumber the advantages of spiritual direction by letter. It is morally impossible for the director to acquire an intimate knowledge of the person directed, unless there is oral communication between them. It is very difficult to express and describe one's interior life in writing. It is equally difficult to understand another person from a written account. Moreover, the spiritual director is not able to make corrections immediately, as he would do if the person were actually speaking to him. Another disadvantage is that the letters may easily fall into the hands of others. In practice, the spiritual director should not be willing to accept the direction of a soul through correspondence unless he already knows the individual and the person has no other recourse. In the actual writing of letters, the director should never write a single line which would in any way constitute a violation of the seal of confession. And if he does receive such material in letters from the person directed, he should destroy the letter as soon as he has read it and should severely forbid the individual from writing such things in the future, under penalty of discontinuing the spiritual direction. Whatever direction is given in writing should be brief and objective. The spiritual director should scrupulously avoid any terms of affection, pet names, excessively cordial salutations, and anything that smacks of sentimentality. Directors who have had experience in direction by mail have been most succinct in their answers, sometimes writing a few words on the letter itself and returning it to the sender without any signature. If in some cases it is necessary to write at greater length, the director will confine himself to the problems or questions presented and to the instruction, exhortation, or correction which the matter demands. He will observe the greatest prudence and delicacy, and never write anything in a letter which he would not wish his bishop or religious superior to read. It should always remember that, in spite of his own good will and zeal, there is always the danger of false interpretations and rash judgments. His letters should always be such that the that he never has anything to fear in this respect. Even the case of accepting the direction of a soul by letter, the director must always give the penitent full liberty to consult other directors. Lastly, both he and the person directed must avoid any kind of secret or clandestine correspondence. If, in the case of a religious, the superior should forbid a subject to write to a spiritual director, this fact should be made known to a higher authority, but the subject should never have recourse to a secret exchange of letters. Does a religious superior have the right to read the letters of objects, subjects, when they deal with matters of conscience or spiritual direction? Ordinarily, no religious superior has this right, because the superior has no direct power over matters of conscience or the internal forum. But if a religious superior has sufficiently grave reasons to suspect that there is an abuse, or that the letter contains matters which have nothing to do with spiritual direction, the majority of authors maintain that a superior could read what is necessary to find out whether or not the letter is truly concerned with spiritual direction. But the superior is bound to the most rigorous secrecy concerning the contents of the letter. Some authors, on the other hand, teach that the superior should make known his or her suspicions to a higher authority and leave the matter in his hands. Others affirm that this others affirm that the superior should destroy the letters without reading them and then advise the subject so that recourse can be had, if desired, to a higher superior. Whatever the method of procedure in a particular case, Superior should keep in mind that it is a serious matter to probe into the consciences of their subjects, and that, therefore, they need a sufficiently grave reason for reading letters in which such matters are discussed. For the peace of soul of the individual, for the unity of the community, for the preservation of confidence and respect from one's subjects, it would seem much more prudent for superiors to trust their subjects, and to read their mail only when it is truly necessary. Mystical Phenomena 1. Basic Notions One of the most interesting of all aspects of the theological study of mysticism is the consideration of those extraordinary phenomena which, customarily, seem to be present in the lives of all the great mystics. This is a difficult and delicate subject, however, and one that should be undertaken with great carefulness and discretion. 
that our consideration of these interesting but difficult matters may be proming as well as solid, and we shall proceed slowly, thoroughly, and carefully. This initial chapter will take up a certain basic notions essential for any proper appreciation of these phenomena, namely, the psychosomatic structure of the human person, his temperament and character, and the discernment of spirits. Indeed, knowledge of these two matters is necessary at every level of the spiritual life if one is properly to direct others, or to be properly directed. But so pertinent it is for our present investigation that we have postponed its formal consideration under the present moment. Then, since one fully knows the things the only causes are known, we shall investigate in a second chapter the causes of extraordinary mystical phenomena. Finally, we shall study in some detail the phenomena themselves. The Psychosomatic Structure It is a truism in psychology that no two personalities are exactly alike. This being so, the perfection of charity will be manifested in different ways, in different persons. A brief glance at the catalogue of canonized saints will suffice to verify the fact that the perfect love of God and neighbor will be greatly modified by the psychosomatic structure of the individual saint. Thus, while all possessed heroic charity, this is remarkable difference in the way in which this charity was carried into the external practice in the lives of such saints as Augustine, Dominic, Francis Xavier, Peter Alacantara, Benedict Labrere, Louis of France, and John of the Cross. The same basic principle of differentiation must be applied to the mystical state, especially when it is a question of extraordinary phenomena. While it is true that in many circumstances only explanation for the occurrence of extraordinary phenomena is to be found in the will of God, who chooses according to his own hidden designs in the distribution of his gifts, one must also take into account the personality of the individual mystic in order to have a clearer understanding of the reason why certain manifestations occur. The psychosomatic structure can react only in a certain number of ways, and the reactions are further limited by the constitutional factors of the individual person. It is an evident fact in the operation of the various organs, cognitive powers, and emotions, when stimulated by their proper objects. The supernatural does not destroy the natural, but works through it in such a way that the human body-soul composite can be a help or a hindrance to the workings of grace. Hence it is of great importance to understand the manner in which man's psychosomatic structure concurs in the work of salvation, although it does so on a purely natural plane, as a dis dispositive cause and by the removal of obstacles. We shall discuss the human personality under the twofold classification of temperament and character, which are the elements which constitute it. There is a diversity of opinion among psychologists concerning the definition and classification of temperament. For our purposes, we may define temperament as a pattern of inclinations which proceed from the physiological constitution of the individual. It is a dynamic factor which takes into account the manner in which the individual organic structure will react to stimuli of various kinds. Since it is rooted in the physiological structure, temperament is something innate and hereditary. It is that element of personality which makes the personality unique. Since individuality is rooted in matter, and temperament is the natural inclination of the somatic structure, it is, therefore, something permanent and admits of only secondary modification. One's temperament can never be totally destroyed without destroying the individual. The axiom, grace does not destroy nature, but perfects it, has its most obvious application in the area of temperament. 
The classification of the temperaments is nothing more than a handy framework which has been constructed according to the predominant characteristics of various physiological con constitutions. It is by no means exclusive or definitive, nor does it signify that there are pure temperaments. As a matter of fact, individual persons generally manifest a combination of the characteristics of several temperaments. Whenever there are several elements combined in any composite, however, one or a, another will usually predominate at any given time, and in the matter of temperaments we find that, although persons are usually a composite of many characteristics, one or another characteristic will specify the temperament. Bearing this in mind, we shall discuss the four temperaments according to the ancient classification of sanguine, melancholic, choleric, and phlegmatic. One, sanguine temperament. A person of sanguine temperament reacts quickly and strongly to almost any stimulation or impression, but the reaction is usually of sort short duration. The stimulation or impression is quickly forgotten and the remembrance of past experiences does not easily arouse a new response. Among the good qualities of the sanguine temperament we may list the following. Affability and cheerfulness. Sympathy and generosity towards others. Sensitivity and compassion for the suffering of others. Docility and submission to senior superiors. Sincerity and spontaneity. There may, at times, be a violent reaction to injuries received, but all is soon forgotten and no rancor remains. There is no obstinacy and stubbornness, but the ability to act with complete self-detachment. Others are attracted by the individual's goodness of heart and contagious enthusiasm. Sanguine persons usually have a serene view of life and are optimists. They are not discouraged by difficulties or obstacles, but hope for a successful outcome in all their efforts. They are gifted with a great deal of common sense and practical approach to life. They tend to idealize rather than criticize. Since they possess an affectionate nature, they make friends easily and sometimes love their friends with great ardor or even passion. Their intellects are alert and they learn quickly, although often without much depth. Their memory dwells on pleasant and optimistic things, and their imagination is active and creative. Consequently, they readily excel in art, oratory, and the related fields, though they do not often attain the stature of learned or scholars. Sanguine persons could be superior types of individuals if they possessed as much depth as they do facility, and if they were as tenacious in their work as they are productive of new ideas and projects. The following saints are examples of the sanguine temperament. St. Peter, St. Augustine, St. Teresa of Avila, St. Francis Xavier, and St. Rose of Lima. But each temperament will also be characterized by certain qualities which are dangerous and could become predispositions, predispositions to evil. Thus, the principal defects of the sanguine temperament are superficiality, inconstancy, and sensuality. The first defect is due primarily to the ease and rapidity in which these persons conceive ideas and the creative activity of their imagination. The first defect is primarily to the ease and rapidity with which these persons conceive ideas and creative activity of their imagination. While they appear to grasp in an instant even the most difficult problems or subject, they appear they sometimes see it only superficiality. While persons conceive ideas and the creative activity of their imagination, 
while they appear to grasp in an instant even the most difficult problem or subject, they sometimes see it only superficially and incompletely. As a result, they sometimes see it only superficial, superficially and incompletely. As a result, they run the risk of hasty judgments, of acting with insufficient reason, and of formulating inaccurate or false conclusions. They are more interested in breadth of knowledge than depth. The inconstancy of the sanguine person is the result of the short duration of his impressions and reactions. He may pass quickly from joy to sorrow. He quickly represents of his sins, but may return to them on the first occasion that presents itself. Being readily moved by the impression of the moment, he easily succumbs to temptation. As a rule, he is not drawn to abnegation, sacrifice, or any effort that is of long duration. For that reason, he has great difficulty in observing custody of the external senses and the imagination, and is easily distracted in prayer. His occasional periods of great fervor are often followed by discouragement and languor. From the foregoing, it is evident that sensuality finds easy access to the sanguine temperament. Such persons are easy victims of gluttony and lust. They may react strongly and with great sorrow after they have fallen, but they lack the energy and perseverance to fight against the inclinations of the flesh, and when the passions are again aroused. The entire organism is quickly alerted when the occasion is offered for sensual pleasure and the strong tendency of the individual to sensuality causes the imagination to produce such phantasms very easily. The development and control of any temperament requires the fostering of its good qualities and the eradication or suppression of its defe defects. The sanguine person should utilize his good qualities such as energy, affection, vivacity, and sensitivity, but he should Take care that these qualities are directed to objects that are good and wholesome. For him, more than any other person, the advice of St. Augustine has special significance. Choose wisely, and then love with all your heart. At the same time, he must fight against the evil inclinations of his sanguine temperament to overcome specific superficiality, he will acquire the habit of reflection and of thinking a matter through before he acts. This means that he has special need of deliberation or judgment as a subjective part of the virtue of prudence. Again, his inconstancy, he will strengthen his will or carry through resolutions that have been made and be faithful in the practice of prayer and the performance of good works, even in periods of aridity or in times of hardship and difficulty. The secondary helps, which are of the greatest importance in this regard, are a plan of life, followed conscientiously, and the daily examination of conscience, with self-imposed penances for failures. Sanguine persons sometimes need an expert director whom they should obey without question. Lastly, sensuality must be combated by constant vigilance and an unrelenting struggle Above all, the sanguine person must flee immediately from the occasion of sin 
and take care to observe a strict custody of the eyes. The custody of the etern external senses and the imagination should be further safeguarded by the practice of recollection and practices of mortification. For it would be futile to try to avoid sensuality if one were to learn to leave the windows of the senses open to every kind of distraction and temptation. 2. The Melancholic Temperament The melancholic temperament is weak in regards reaction to stimulus, and it is difficult to arouse. However, after repeated impressions, the reaction is strong and lasting, so that the melancholic temperament does not easily forget. As regards good qualities which serve as predispositions to virtue, persons of melancholic temperament are inclined to reflection, solitude, piety, and the interior life. They are compassionate towards those who suffer, attracted to the corporal works of mercy, and able to endure suffering to the point of heroism in the performance of their duties. They have a sharp and profound intellect, and, because of their natural bent to solitude and reflection, they generally consider matters thoroughly in silence and tranquility. They may become detached in dry intellectuals, or contemplatives who are concerned solely with the things of God. They are usually appreciative of the fine arts, but are more drawn to the sciences, especially the speculative sciences. As regards their effective powers, when they love when they love, it is with difficulty that they detach themselves from the object of their love. They suffer greatly if others treat them with coldness or ingratitude. The power of their will is greatly affected by their physical strength and health. If their if their physical powers are exhausted, their will is weak and practically null, but if they are in good health and spirit, they are energetic workers and joyful in spirit. They have great sobriety and continence because they seldom experience the dis disorderly passions which may torment the persons of the sanguine temperament. We may st say in a general we may say in general that this temperament is opposed to the sanguine temperate as the choleric temperament is opposed to the phlegmatic temperament. Among the saints who possess this particular temperament are Saint John the Beloved Disciple, St. Bernard, St. Louis Gonzaga, and St. Therese of Lisieux. The unfavorable traits of this melancholic temperament are the following. An exaggerated tendency to sa sadness and melancholy an inclination to magnify difficulties and thus to lose confidence in self, excessive reserve and timidity, with a propensity to scrupulosity, lack of resolution. Person of melancholic temperament do not show their feelings as do the sanguine, they suffer in silence because they find it difficult to reveal themselves. 
They always seem to see the difficult and pessimistic side of things. Many enterprises are never begun because of their lack of confidence and resolution. Those who are in charge of educating or training the melancholic temperament should keep in mind their strong tendency to concentrate excessively on themselves. Otherwise, there is danger of doing them an injustice or of treating them in a tactless manner. It is important to inculcate in these persons a strong confidence in God and in themselves, as well as a more optimistic view of life. Since they have good intellects and tend to reflection, they should be made to realize that there is no reason for them to be timid or irresolute. At all costs, the director must destroy their indecision and cowardice and get them to make firm resolutions and to undertake projects with enthusiasm, enthusiasm and optimism. Sometimes it is necessary to give them a special regimen of rest and nourishment and to forbid them to spend long hours in prayer and solitude or observe fasts. 3. The Choleric Temperament Persons of a choleric temperament are easily and strongly aroused and the impression lasts for a long time. Theirs is the temperament which produces great saints or great sinners. While all the temperaments can be utilized as a material for sanctity, it seems that the largest number of canonized saints possessed a choleric temperament. The good qualities of the temperament can be summarized as follows. Great energy and activity, sharp intellect, strong and resolute will, good powers of concentration, constancy, magnanimity, and liberality. Choleric persons are Choleric persons are practical rather than theoretical. They are more inclined to work than to think. Inactivity is repugnant to them, and they are always looking forward to the next. next labor or to the formulation of some great project. Once they have set upon a plan of work, they immediately set their hand to the task. Hence, this temperament produces many leaders, superiors, apostles. It is the temperament of government and administration. These persons do not leave for tomorrow what they can do today, but sometimes they may try to do today what they should leave for tomorrow. If difficulties or obstacles arise, they immediately set about to overcome them, and although they have strong movements of irascibility and impatience in the face of the problems, once they have conquered these movements, they acquire a tenderness and sweetness of disposition which are noteworthy. The saints 
who possess a choleric temperament are numerous, but we shall mention only St. Paul, St. Jerome, St. Ignatius Loyola, and St. Francis de Sales. The tenacity of the choleric temperament sometimes produces the following evil effects, hardness, obstinacy, insensibility, anger, and pride. If choleric persons are resisted, they may easily become violent, cruel, arrogant, unless the Christian virtues moderate these inclinations. If defeated by others, they may nurture hatred in their hearts until they have obtained their vengeance. They easily become ambitious and seek their own glory. They have greater patience than do the sanguine, but they may lack delicacy of feeling, are often insensitive to the feelings of others, and therefore lack tact in human relations. Their passions, when aroused, are so strong and impetuous that they smother the more tender emotions and the spirit of sacrifice which springs spontaneously from more sympathetic hearts. Their fever for activity and their eagerness to execute their resolutions cause them to disregard others to thrust all impediments aside, and to give the appearance of being heartless egotists. In their treatment of others, they sometimes display a coldness and indifference which reaches the point of cruelty. The only rights which they acknowledge are the satisfaction and attainment of their desires. It is evident from the foregoing that if the choleric person pursues the path of evil, there is no length to which he will not go in order to achieve his goal. Choleric persons can be individuals of great worth if they succeed in controlling and guiding their energies. They could arrive at the height of perfection with relative facility. In their hands, even the most difficult tasks seem to be brought to an easy and ready solution. Therefore, when they have themselves under the control and are rightly directed, they will not cease in their efforts until they have reached the summit they must be taught to keep themselves under the reins of self-mastery, not to act with precipitation, but to mistrust their first inclinations. Above all, they need to cultivate the true humility of heart to be compassionate to the weak and to the uninstructed, not to, not to humiliate or embarrass others, not to exert their own superiority, 
and to treat all persons with tenderness and understanding. In a word, they could be taught how to be detached from self and to manifest a generous love towards others. Four, phlegmatic temperament. The phlegmatic is rarely aroused emotionally, and if so, only weakly. The impressions received usually last for only a short time and leave no trace. The good characteristics of the phlegmatic person are that he works slowly but assiduously. He is not easily irritated by insults, misfortunes, or sickness. He usually remains tranquil, discreet, and sober. He has a great deal of common sense and mental balance. He does not possess the inflammable passions of the sanguine temperament, the deep passions of the melancholic temperament, or the ardent passions of the choleric temperament. In his speech, he is shortly In his speech, he is orderly, clear, positive, and measured, rather than florid and picturesque. He is more suited to scientific work, which is the fruit of long and patient research, and minute investigation than to original productions. He has a good heart, but it seems to be cold. He would sacrifice to the point of heroism if it were necessary, but he lacks enthusiasm and spontaneity because he is reserved and somewhat indolent by nature. He is prudent, sensible, reflexive, and works with a measured pace. He attains his goals without fanfare or violence because he usually avoids the difficulties rather than attacking them. Physically, the phlegmatic is usually a robust build, slow in his movements, and possesses an amiable face. St. Thomas Aquinas seems to have possessed the best qualities of the phlegmatic temperament. The defective qualities of the phlegmatic temperament are as follows. Their slowness and calmness cause these persons to lose many good opportunities because they delay in so long in putting works into operation. They are not too interested in events that take place around them, but they tend to live by and for themselves, almost to the point of egoism. They are not suitable 
for government and administration. They are not usually drawn to corporal penances and mortification, as St. Teresa points out. And there is no fear that they will kill themselves by penance and self-abnegation. In extreme cases, they become so lethargic and insensible that they become completely deaf to the invitation or command that would rise them out of their stupor. The phlegmatic can avoid bad effects of his temperament if he is inculcated with deep convictions and if he develops demands of himself methodical and constant efforts towards greater perfection. He will advance slowly, to be sure, but he will advance far. Above all, he must not be allowed to become indolent and apathetic, but should be directed to some lofty ideal. He, too, needs to gain control of himself, not as the choleric, who must restrain and moderate himself, but to rouse himself and put his dominant powers to good use. Having seen a brief description of the four basic temperaments, we repeat that none of these temperaments actually exists in a pure state. The reader himself may not be aware that the complete portrait of his own temperament has not been found in any one of the four temperaments but that he possesses characteristics of several. This explanation, to a large extent, why there are so many different opinions and theories in psychology on the question of temperaments, nevertheless, each person will exhibit sufficient predominant qualities of a given temperament so that he can be classified under the particular type. If we were to attempt to delineate If we were to attempt to delineate the perfect temperament we would select the best qualities of each temperament taking care that they are not mutually exclusive. But we would take from this sanguine his sympathy, generous heart, and vivacity, from the melancholic, the depth and delicacy of feeling, from the choleric, 
his inexhaustible energy and tenacity and from the phlegmatic his self-control prudence and perseverance in striving for this ideal which the nature herself does not want us to grant to anyone we enter upon the problem of the ascetical struggle which involves the difficult task of the formation of character.